Roughing It by Mark Twain. I met three friends one afternoon who said they had been buying Overman stock at auction at eight dollars a foot. One said if I would come up to his office, he would give me 15 feet. Another said he would add 15. The third said he would do the same. But I was going after an inquest and could not stop. A few weeks afterward, they sold all their overman at $600 a foot and generously, generously came around to tell me about it and also to urge me to accept of the next 45 feet of it that people tried to force on me. These are actual facts, and I could make the list a long one and still confine myself strictly to the truth. Many a time, friends gave, uh, gave us as much as 25 feet of stock that was selling at $25 a foot, and they thought no more of it than they would of offering a guest a cigar. These were flush times, indeed. I thought they were going to last always, but somehow I never was much of a prophet. And then there's a portrait of Mr. Stewart, who has on a somewhat rumpled stovepipe hat. And he has a wart on his chin and, a, and an eye patch over his left eye. To show what a wild spirit possessed the mining brain of the community, I will remark that claims were actually located in excavations for cellars where the pick had exposed what seemed to be quartz veins, and not cellars in the suburbs either, but in the very heart of the city. And forthwith, stock would be issued and thrown on the market. It was small matter who the seller belonged to. The ledge belonged to the finder, and unless the United States government interfered, inasmuch as the government holds the primary right to mines of the noble metals in Nevada, or at least did then, it was considered to be his privilege to work it. Imagine a stranger staking out a mining claim among the costly shrubbery in your front yard and calmly proceeding to lay waste the ground with pick and shovel and blasting powder. It has been done often, it has often, it has been often done in California. In the middle of one of the principal business streets of Virginia, a man located a mining claim and began to shaft on it. Began a shaft on it. He gave me a hundred feet of the stock and I sold it for a fine suit of clothes because I was afraid somebody would fall down the shaft and sue for damages. I owned in another claim that was located in the middle of another street and to show how absurd people can be that East India stock, as it was called, sold briskly although there was an ancient tunnel running directly under the claim and any man could go into it and see that it did cut a quartz that it did not cut a quartz ledge or anything that remotely resembled one one plan of acquiring sudden wealth was to salt a wildcat claim and sell out while the excitement was up the process was simple the schemer located a worthless ledge, sunk a shaft on it, bought a wagon load of rich Comstock ore, dumped a portion of it into the shaft, and piled the rest by its side above ground. Then he showed the property to a simpleton and sold it to him at a high figure. Of course, the wagon load of rich ore was all that the victim ever got out of his purchase. A most remarkable case of salting was that of the North O'Fair. It was claimed that this vein was a remote extension of the original Ophir, a valuable mine on the Comstock. For a few days, everybody was talking about the rich developments in the North Ophir. It was said that it yielded perfectly pure silver in small, solid lumps. I went to the place with the owners and found a shaft six or eight feet deep, in the bottom of which was a badly shattered vein of dull, yellowish, unpromising rock. One would as soon expect to find silver in a grindstone. We got out a pan of the rubbish and washed it in a puddle, and sure enough, among the sediment, we found half a dozen black, bullet-looking pellets of unimpeachable native silver. Nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. Science could not account for such a queer novelty. The stock rose to $65 a foot, and at this figure, the world-renowned tragedian 
McKeon Buchanan bought a commending interest and prepared to quit the stage once more. He was always doing that. And then it transpired that the mine had been salted, and not in any hackneyed way either, but in a singularly bold, barefaced, and peculiarly original and outrageous fashion. One of the lumps of native silver was dis let's see, on one of the lumps of native silver, quotes, was discovered the minted legend Ted States of and then it was plainly apparent that the mine had been salted with melted half dollars. <laughs> the lumps thus obtained had been blackened till they resembled native silver and were then mixed with the shattered rock in the bottom of the shaft. It is literally true. Of course, the, piece of the, the price of the stock at once fell to nothing, and the tragedian was ruined. But before this calamity, we might have lost McKeon Buchanan from the stage. Chapter 45. Flush Times Continue. Sanitary Commission Fund. Wild enthusiasm of the people would not wait to contribute. The sanitary flour sack. It is carried to Gold Hill and Dayton. Final reception in Virginia. Results of the sale. A grand total. The flush times held bravely on. Something over two years before, Mr. Goodman and another journeyman printer had borrowed forty dollars and set out from San Francisco to try their fortunes in the new city of Virginia. They found the Territorial Enterprise, a poverty-stricken weekly journal, gasping for breath and likely to die. They bought it, type, fixtures, goodwill and all, for a thousand dollars on long time. Uh, the editorial sanctum, newsroom, press room, publication office, bedchamber, parlor, and kitchen were all compressed into one apartment, and it was a small one, too. The editors and printers slept on the floor. A Chinaman did their cooking, and the imposing stone was the general dinner table. But now things were changed. The paper was a great daily, printed by steam. There were five editors and 23 compositors. The subscription price was $16 a year. The advertising rates were exorbitant and the columns crowded. The paper was clearing from six to $10,000 a month and the Enterprise Building was finished and ready for occupation. A stately fireproof brick. Every day from five all the way up to 11, columns of live advertisements were left out or crowded into spasmodic and irregular supplements. The Gold and Curry Company were erecting a monster hundred stamp mill at a cost that ultimately fell little short of a million dollars. Gold and Curry stock paid heavy dividends, a rare thing, and an experience confined to the dozen or fifteen claims located on the main lead, the Comstock. The superintendent of the Gold and Curry lived rent free in a fine house built and furnished by the company. He drove a fine pair of horses which were a present from the company, and his salary was twelve thousand dollars a year. The superintendent of another of another of the great mines traveled in grand state, had a salary of twenty eight thousand dollars a year, and in a lawsuit in after days claimed that he was to have had one percent of the gross yield of the bullion likewise. Money was wonderfully plenty. The trouble was not how to get it, but how to spend it, how to lavish it, get rid of it, squander it. And so it was a happy thing that just at this juncture the news came over the wires that a great United States Sanitary Commission had been formed, and money was wanted for the relief of the wounded sailors and soldiers of the Union languishing in the eastern hospitals. Right on the heels of it came word that San Francisco had responded superbly before the telegram was half a day old. Virginia rose as one man. A sanitary committee was hurriedly organized, and its chairman mounted a vacant cart in C Street and tried to make the clamorous multitude understand 
that the rest of the committee were flying hither and thither and working with all their might and main, and that if the town would only wait an hour, an office would be ready. Books opened, and the commission prepared to receive contributions. His voice was drowned and his information lost in a ceaseless roar of cheers and demands that the money be received now. They swore they would not wait. The chairman pleaded and argued, but deaf to all entreaty, the men plowed their way through the throng and rained checks of gold coin into the cart and scurried away for more. Hands clutching money were thrust aloft out of the jam by men who hoped this eloquent appeal would cleave a road, cleave a road their strugglings could not open. The very Chinamen and Indians caught the excitement and dashed their half dollars into the cart without knowing or caring what it was all about. Women plunged into the crowd, trimly attired, fought their way to the cart with their coin, and emerged again, by and by, with their apparel in a state of hopeless dilapidation. It was the wildest mob Virginia had ever seen, and the most determined and ungovernable. And when at last it abated its fury and dispersed, it had not a penny in its pocket. To use its own phraseology, it came there flush and went away busted. After that, the commission got itself into systematic working order, and for weeks the contributions flowed into its treasury in a generous stream. Individuals and all sorts of organizations levied upon themselves a regular weekly tax for the sanitary fund, graduated according to their means. And there was not another grand universal, universal outburst till the famous sanitary flower sack came our way. Its history is peculiar and interesting. A former schoolmate of mine by the name of Raoul Gridley was living in the little city of Austin in the Reese River country at this time and was the Democratic candidate for mayor. He and the Republican candidate made an agreement that the defeated man should be publicly presented with a 50-pound sack of flour by the successful one and should carry it home on his shoulder. Greedley was defeated. The new mayor gave him the sack of flour and he shouldered it and carried it a mile or two from Lower Austin to his home in Upper Austin attended by a band of music and the whole population. Arrived there, he said he did not need the flower and asked what the people thought he had better do with it. A voice said, Sell it to the highest bidder for the benefit of the sanitary fund. The suggestion was greeted with a round of applause, and Gridley mounted a dry goods box and assumed the role of auctioneer. The birds went higher and higher as the sympathy as the sympathies of the pioneers awoke and expanded.